the unidentified wiki pages. An archive dedicated to chronicling John and Jane Doe's with the intention of informing the public and raising awareness about their cases. Many of the pages found on this wiki make for stomach churning reads, and today we'll be going over a handful of the most unsettling articles the site has to offer. Today's video is sponsored by Raycon. Raycon's on a mission to prove that you shouldn't have to pay an arm and a leg for quality sound and essential smart tech listening features. Their earbuds start at half the price of other top audio brands on the market, meaning that you could get a pair and a spare and still pay less than you would with some of the other big name tech brands, and they sound just as good, if not better. With 8 hours of playtime for their everyday earbuds, custom gel tips for the perfect, most comfortable in-ear fit, and a whole range of features like their three customizable sound profiles. Raycon earbuds aren't just affordable and stylish, they're extremely convenient and reliable, and make the perfect partner for any activity. Whether you're commuting by train, exercising at the gym, or relaxing with your favourite audio content on the sofa, Raycon gives you the audio quality and build quality that you deserve. I like to use mine while working out, because as you can see, Raycon earbuds stay in place no matter what. Not to mention, they're sweat resistant. So if you're ready to get your hands on a pair of awesome earbuds at a great price, while also supporting the channel, now's your chance. Click the link in my description box, or go to buyraycon.com forward slash masquerade to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Be part of the next wave of premium wireless audio with Raycon. On March 27, 1971, an off-duty policeman was walking his dog in the Newton Road area of Burton, England, when he made a chilling discovery. As he and his canine chum made their way through a wooded thicket by the roadside, the officer almost tripped over a round, off-white object protruding from a mound of earth. Upon closer inspection, he realised what it was. A human skull. Mortified by what he had found, he immediately called his superiors, and an investigation was quickly launched. After excavating the mound, detectives unearthed a complete skeleton. An analysis revealed that it belonged to a young man, aged somewhere between 23 and 39. Given the state of his remains, he had likely been in the ground for between 9 and 12 months. Whoever he was, he had almost certainly been the victim of a homicide, his life cruelly snuffed out. The man's hands had been tied behind his back with a cord, and his feet were bound together. He had been placed in his grave upright, in the kneeling position. The only clothes that he had been buried in were a pair of pink and yellow socks. All of his other garments were missing. That sounded to many like the calling card of a serial killer, some sort of twisted joke a final humiliation. Despite this definitely being a male skeleton though, a lady's 9 carat gold wedding ring was also found on the right finger of the victim's right hand. The ring had been manufactured in the late 60s by Henry Showell Limited. Only 5,000 were ever made. Since his skull was the first part of his body to be found poking out of the earth, this John Doe was given the nickname Fred the Head. A little insensitive perhaps, but the name ended up sticking. Thanks to the wonders of technology, these detailed composites have since been created to show what Fred may have looked like in life. According to forensic experts, Fred had short, brown to black, straight hair. He stood around 5 foot 8, possessed a thin build, and had small hands with well-kept fingernails. Most distinctive however, were his physical abnormalities. Fred had a significant amount of dental work done to his teeth, and even had a partial upper denture fitted no more than six months before his slaying. His jaw would have stuck out more than the average person's, and his chin would have appeared large. Fred also suffered from torticollis, otherwise known as a wry neck, meaning that his head would have leant to the right, making him all the more identifiable. That being said, it's unknown how much this neck condition would have affected his appearance. Veterans of this channel may remember when I covered the Ina Jane Doe, now identified as Susan Hope Lund. 
just like Fred, Susan suffered from Reineck, leading forensic artists to create this uncanny composite, which depicted her with a severely tilted head. When her true identity was finally discovered 29 years later, it became obvious that Susan's Reineck wasn't nearly as pronounced as the authorities believed. In fact, it was barely noticeable at all. This effet really emphasised her torticollis in hopes of it jogging the right person's memory, but in the end, since she really didn't suffer badly from the condition at all, it may have actually had the opposite effect and slowed down the investigation. In that sense, we should take Fred the Head's Reineck with a pinch of salt as well. Sure, it may have had a tremendous impact on his visual appearance, but it may also have been a near invisible condition. Unfortunately, the authorities weren't able to match Fred to any missing persons reports, and nobody came forward to claim his bones. Despite having so many recognisable features, nobody seemed to have any idea who Fred the Head actually was. With few leads to work with, the investigation into Fred's demise sadly froze over. One of the main theories circulating online is that Fred may have been the first victim of the Camden Ripper, Anthony Hardy, a man who took the lives of at least three women in the early 2000s, though he may also have been responsible for six additional slayings too. He was brought to justice in December 2002, when a homeless man scavenging in bins found the dismembered body parts of two of his victims, wrapped in black bin liners. Not only was Hardy born and raised in the same area where Fred was unearthed, but he also liked to dress his victims in special socks. Mr. Men socks to be specific. Mr. Happy socks to be even more specific. The fact that Fred was found wearing only socks appeared to be a possible link. However, there are many who disagree with this theory. All of Hardy's other confirmed victims were females, and his rampage began three decades after Fred's life was cut short. Still, could Fred have been a test run for a budding young serial slayer? His first taste of blood? Or was this all the handiwork of someone much less infamous, but equally as sinister? The work of a still uncaught killer, or killers. Just last week, a man named Ken Davies, who runs the Fred the Head podcast, announced that he may have uncovered the victim's true identity. He posits that Fred was actually this man, John Gick, a 37-year-old scoutmaster who went missing in February 1969, 18 months before Fred the Head's remains were discovered. The day he vanished, John had travelled to Liverpool from the Isle of Man for a scouting event. At 4pm, he left his scouts in the care of a colleague, telling them that he had to meet somebody, but that he'd return at 6.40. He never did. At 5pm, witnesses saw John being attacked by a gang of youths. John then stumbled off by himself, never to be seen again. His van was found abandoned in Liverpool the following day. Now Liverpool is roughly a 2 hour 15 minute journey car ride from Burton. So why does Ken Davies think that John Kick and Fred the Head are one and the same? Well, just like Fred the Head, John Gick is known to have had extensive dental work done to his teeth, and, crucially, also suffered from Reineck. On top of that, the timeline adds up, the physical characteristics are a match, and John Gick was within the age range that experts put on Fred the Head. The authorities are currently looking in to whether Fred and John truly were the same person. Hopefully a DNA test will reveal the truth in the near future. Perhaps then the perpetrator, and their motive, will finally come to light as well, five long decades after they committed their grisly act. Many of the cases covered on the Unidentified Wiki aren't unsettling because of how horrific their write-ups are, but actually because of how little information exists about the victim. For some, there's next to no available details to cover. In an existential sense, those pages are arguably more terrifying than their more comprehensive counterparts. These unknown does, all once individuals like you or me, with names and lives and hopes, who were all lost to time.
their identities and stories almost completely forgotten. One such example from the wiki would be 1999's Dallas County John Doe, a man whose skeletal remains were found along US Route 80 in Alabama. His remains were in such a bad state that pathologists said he could have been anywhere between 18 and 99 years old when he perished. A mouldy wallet was found near his person. Inside it was a driver's license, which featured this faded image. This is believed to be the face of the John Doe. Using modern AI software, the image has since been enhanced, allowing us to get a much more detailed glimpse of his face. In most cases, the discovery of a license would be the only lead detectives would need to figure out who a victim was. And that would have been the same in Dallas County's case too, had the ID not been so old and tattered. Unfortunately, the name on the license had all but been rubbed away, and was completely illegible. As for identifiable clothing, at the time of his end, Dallas County John Doe had been wearing a dark t-shirt beneath a red and blue plaid Timberline long sleeve shirt, along with a synthetic black jacket and black trousers. A semi-auto pistol with two spent rounds and three unspent was also found resting beside him. It's unknown whether he used this .25 cal to remove himself from the world, or whether he had used it to try and protect himself from whoever did. Who Dallas County John Doe was in life, and how that life came to an end, remain mysteries to this day. Nobody has ever come forward to identify him. He's never been linked to any missing persons reports, and if foul play was indeed involved, the perp has never been ID'd, and could still be walking among us. Perhaps one day, this John Doe will be given back his name, but with so few details available, and no known developments since 1999, that seems extremely unlikely. All we can say with certainty is that such enigmatic cases are far from uncommon. And that's why I think the Unidentified Wiki is such an important archive. It helps to raise awareness about cases that rarely, if ever, receive media attention, and helps to keep the search for their identities, and killers, alive. The year was 2017. Rebecca Jane Alsop, or Becky as she preferred to be called, was a 34-year-old woman living a difficult existence, made all the more difficult by her husband, Craig Allen Wood. The couple lived together in a camping trailer situated on Craig's parents' property in Williamsville, Missouri. Their relationship was a rocky one to say the least. Not only were they both habitual heroin users, but Craig had, on numerous occasions, threatened to take Becky's life if she didn't do what he told her to. For instance, when he was once caught carrying illicit substances, he told Becky she had to speak in his defense, or else. On February 17th, 2017, Becky went missing. This greatly worried her loved ones. Becky had an underlying heart condition, and needed daily medication to survive medication which she had left behind at the trailer. She had last been seen at approximately 1pm that day, when a friend of hers came over to check on how she was doing. This friend was well aware of the turbulent relationship that she had with her husband, and would occasionally drop by to assess Becky's well-being. According to this friend, Becky was, quote, freaking out and shaking. Her husband Craig had apparently stolen some of her money and destroyed her SIM card so she couldn't make or receive any calls. When it came to her disappearance, for obvious reasons, her husband Craig was quickly determined to be suspect number one. Now it's not unusual for a victim's partner to be considered the prime suspect early on into an investigation, but in Craig's case, detectives had a bit more to base that on than a mere hunch. Just one year prior to Becky's vanishing, in 2016, Craig had approached a hitman and asked him to kill his wife. In exchange, he offered him three cars, 
a motorcycle, and half of Becky's life insurance payout. The hitman turned down the offer. Craig then asked him what would happen if he were to, say, inject his wife with bong water. The hitman replied that this would probably result in her slow and painful demise. Not long after that conversation, Becky was rushed to the hospital in a critical condition, comatose and unresponsive. Despite being unsure of what had happened to her, doctors were able to save her life, but had to amputate both of her legs. While still unconscious and in a critical state in hospital, Craig tried to have Becky taken off life support. Since he was unable to prove that he was her husband at the time though, the doctors refused to comply with his request. Craig would later approach that same hitman again, and told him that he had syringed his wife with the pipe water, but that it, quote, didn't kill them. He also mentioned that he knew several good locations that he could have hidden her body, places where she would never be found. After Becky's disappearance in 2017, that hitman came forward and shared his story. Not only that, another key witness also came forward, the son of one of Becky's friends. This unnamed witness had apparently been in the area on the day that Becky went missing, and claims to have caught Craig moving her remains post-slaying. Craig had allegedly forced said witness to help hide Becky's body. According to the witness, a group of individuals, whom he refused to identify, took his car and used it to transport Becky to another location. When the car was returned to him, he found blood and hair inside it. When the investigating officers asked to take a look at his car, the witness told them that he no longer had it. Terrified of Craig and his friends, and not wanting to get involved in this mess any further, he had thoroughly cleaned the car and sold it to a stranger. By the time the investigators located the buyer, the car had already been sold to a local scrapyard, where it had been destroyed, along with any potential evidence inside it. The day after Becky went missing, the witness's father went over to her and Craig's trailer to investigate himself, and noticed Becky's prosthetic legs burning in a barrel outside. Court documents have since revealed the police's working hypothesis, that Craig had taken Becky's life by bludgeoning her in the head with an ashtray. Presumably, some trace amounts of human matter were found on an ashtray in Becky and Craig's shared home, though that hasn't been confirmed by the authorities. In the end, the murder charge against Craig was dismissed due to a lack of evidence, though the prosecutors do plan on refiling the charge in the future. However, Craig didn't completely dodge his bullet. He was arrested again for violating his probation, and is currently serving a seven-year sentence. His cellmate in prison has since told the investigators that on more than one occasion, he's heard Craig sobbing in his bunk, and saying how he shouldn't have taken Becky's life. The search for Becky's remains is still ongoing. On September 21st, 2001, the torso of a young male, aged somewhere between four and seven, was dragged from the Thames River in London, England, wearing only a pair of bright orange shorts made exclusively in Germany. His limbs and head were nowhere to be found. With nothing to identify the remains with, the investigators named the doe, Adam. A search for his missing parts, his true name, and his slayer was quickly launched. After being examined by experts, it was determined that Adam had been poisoned by a substance that rendered him incapable of movement. His throat was then cut open. After being completely exsanguinated, his arms, legs, and head were expertly removed. Trace minerals in his remains suggested that he had only been in the UK for a few days before being slain. A DNA analysis suggested that he was of southwestern Nigerian descent. That was of particular interest to the authorities, and led detectives to consider a truly chilling hypothesis. That Adam had been brought to the UK by human traffickers for the sole purpose of being slaughtered in a ritual sacrifice. That might seem like a jump, but let me explain. 
Nigeria has long had a problem with ritual slayings. A small number of desperate locals believe that burning body parts can bring good fortune and wealth. In 2014, a warehouse filled to the brim with human body parts and chained up prisoners was discovered in Soka Forest, Nigeria. This human abattoir was being used by human traffickers to collect and sell human heads and limbs to ritualists. 27 people inside were saved, though it's unknown just how many more people before them have been harvested. Since this practice was already well known back in 2001, the UK investigators posited that Adam had been purchased by a wealthy ritualist living in London and had met with a similar fate at the hands of a witch doctor. In 2011, a woman in Germany named Joyce Sosiagede was approached by the UK detectives who suspected that she may have been involved in Adam's case. Joyce told them that some years prior, she had actually fled a Yoruba cult in Nigeria and made her way to Germany. While living there, she met a young, homeless lad whose parents had been deported. As such, she decided to care for him. According to Joyce, that youngster was Adam, though also according to her, his actual name was Ikpomosa. After searching Joyce's home, detectives found a pair of identical orange shorts to the ones Adam was found in. A pair of social workers in Germany also corroborated Joyce's story, claiming that they had seen Joyce caring for a skinny youth. That's all to say, her story seemed to add up. Joyce confided in the authorities that a man named Kingsley Ojo, a fellow Nigerian, was the person responsible for Adam's slaying. Kingsley was a human trafficker, who shipped people from his home country to Europe. Joyce also gave them a photo of the youth that she called Ikwamosa. It seemed like Adam had just been given his real name back. After searching Kingsley Ojo's home, investigators did indeed find several ritual items, though unfortunately, they were unable to link any of them to Adam's case. They also learned that the photo Joyce had given them was actually of a youngster who was still alive and well living in Germany, meaning Adam wasn't Tik Pomosa, and his identity was still unknown. In 2013, Joyce changed her tune and told the authorities that she had made a mistake, that Adam's real name was actually Patrick Erhaber. Given her delicate mental state, the investigators have their doubts about her story. 21 years have passed since Adam's torso was found floating in the River Thames, and in all those years, none of his missing body parts have been discovered, and his slayers have never formally been identified and brought to justice. That being said, it's strongly suspected that King's Leojo was indeed involved in his demise, and that Joyce was likely an unwilling accomplice. The Met continue to search for answers in Adam's case. Adam has not and will not be forgotten, said Chief Inspector Kate Kieran in a 2021 interview. He deserved better, and we will not give up on him. A big thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Dustin and Tiffany Vanderpool, Gina Valera, Hamish, Ian Billock, Infamous Sempappy, Jesse Jug, Leonardo Martinez, Monica Mendoza, Mrs. Avon Rankin, Peter Logdredge, Connor Lothan, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, The Only Dorita, TNS Mum, Zane, Alex Greensall, Asia Mina, Asriel Warakai, Brad Hammer 33, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Verily Verdant, Hamish K, Sonic Narcotic, Lydia Cumo, Nefus1988, and Itai Alon. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. Until next time, my friends. The Devils in the Detail.